My life has taken me on many adventures. And on the advice of my mentor, I took my greatest adventure yet to Santa Cruz. Now imagine me coming down the twisting turns of the Highway 17 on my Vespa. <laughs> Don't worry, I got off of Idlewild. <laughs> and I arrived at the most beautiful place I'd ever seen. From the boardwalk to West Cliff, to the koi ponds of the Poganip trails, everywhere seemed like it had a story to tell. And in the spirit of adventure, I ended up at Evergreen Cemetery, one of the oldest still operating cemeteries in all of California. Now, Evergreen had plenty of its own stories to tell, from the famous to the infamous, American war veterans, and even a memorial to some of California's earliest Chinese community members, and also a memorial to pioneer, gold miner, and philanthropist, Loughton Nelson. Now, as I stood at his gravesite, I saw this placard, and I'll read in summary. Loughton Nelson, a literate slave, traveled to California with his master, Matthew Nelson, struck gold during the gold rush, and left his entire estate, will, and property to the city of Santa Cruz to reopen the schools for the children. And it was in that moment I had a hunch that there was a little something more to this story. Now, I end up in these situations because I am what I like to call professionally nosy, <laughs> or curious and bold, or more commonly known as a research historian. I come from a long line of curious and bold people. My maternal grandfather is one of the first black fire chiefs of Washington, D.C. My paternal grandparents are art collectors, entrepreneurs, and some of the first black people hired by the United States Postal Service. And my maternal grandmother was the first black woman to become a park ranger in the National Park Service. Now, this meant I spent my Easter's hunting for eggs in the lush gardens of the Frederick Douglass home, and my mom spent her summers at the Grand Canyon while my grandmother was the first black woman to complete the 15-month rigorous park ranger training. I come from a long line of people who explore history, interrogate history, and analyze history. Now, part of having a family so deeply enmeshed in the National Park Service means you get to spend your summers with your grandmother while she gives moving historical speeches in front of large groups of people. Wonder where I got that from. <laughs> and it also means that while she's giving her trainings and she gives you $20, your eight-year-old cousin, long before cell phones, and tell you to find your way back to the visitor center before sundown, you realize the importance of the placards. <laughs> And trust me, I read every single one of them. See, the placards tell you why here, why now, why this place, and why is it important to, sal to salvage this information, and also where the bathrooms and visitor centers are. <laughs> this question of why here, why now, and why this place has led me to finding my place in my community as a shrine keeper. A shrine keeper is one who attends to the estates, legacies, and grave sites of those who come before them. From the naming of libraries to the building of monuments, it's deeply important to the human experience to salvage and save the memories and stories of those who came before us. So as I stood in front of this placard and I saw Loudon London Nelson, I had a hunch that led me to go before city council and petition to have London Nelson's name officially changed. Following this hunch has also led me to create the London Nelson Legacy Initiative and to become the historian in residence at the Santa Cruz Museum of Art and History. <laughs> now, part of being a historian in residence means I get access to the raw historical data. And it is important to know that any historical narrative that you're reading is an interpretation of the raw historical data through the lens of the historian who is writing it. It's also important to know that this raw data doesn't include the full story. In fact, these forms, documents, and wills are often used to distort, skew, and even erase the true story of what happened. 
For example, previous Santa Cruz historians looked at the 1849 El Dorado County historic records and saw a master and two slaves and decided that Ledon Nelson had no living descendants. However, as a historian from that community, and specifically someone who was a descendant of the crimes of chattel slavery in North and South Carolina, this looked like a story of a father and a son, of a family's resilience through the crimes of chattel slavery and human trafficking. So that's why I believe that following a hunch is a valid catalyst for scientific, social, and historic inquiry. Now, following a hunch is a research methodology that I've developed. H. Is this historically logical? Does it make sense for this to happen in this time and in this way? Is it possible that the author is missing key details that will only be known if you, you have an understanding of the community that you're reporting on? Does this author have the contextual intelligence to pick out what might be missing or even being erased from these stories? Now, this contextual intelligence gives you the context to understand in the nuances of these relationships. Nuances come from immersion into a cultural experience. Not just what's written, but what's unwritten. Not just what's spoken, but what's unspoken. For example, if a historian is reading something and they say their cousin moved away and ain't seen him in a hot minute, do they understand how to interpret that unit of time? <laughs> Now, these cultural experiences come from being immersed in C, community. Or simply put, is this work done for us and by us? Do they pass the FUBU test, is what I call it. <laughs> Now, for example, is the universe researching indigenous people so that they can profit from the owning and selling of this information in a book? Or is the information done by indigenous community members so that they can preserve the information that has been systemically taken away from them? And H, does this ultimately honor the legacy of those who they are reporting on? Do their descendants know how to find their ancestors? Do their grave sites have headstones? Or even more simply put, are their names even spelled correctly? Now, this work that I've done with the London Nelson Legacy Initiative has uncovered the names and identities of at least 17 people buried in unmarked graves at Evergreen Cemetery. These 17 people were previously enslaved, but traveled to California before, during, or shortly after the gold rush. Despite over 20 million people being trafficked during the crimes of slavery, very few intact burial grounds still exist. This finding at Evergreen Cemetery is historic, it's sacred, and it is healing. The London Nelson Legacy Initiative seeks to create a full historical narrative about these 17 people. And we hope to reach out to their descendants and say, honey, your ancestors got free. They made their way all the way to California, struck gold and are resting in peace in a beautiful redwood grove in a little beach town in Santa Cruz, steps away from the Poganips right by the beachfront. Now, despite this information being known for decades, it wasn't openly shared with the black community. And my hope here is to share this information with you all. Now, following a hunch is what led to this community healing, which is going to lead to community empowerment. Following this hunch helped me go from the little girl reading the placards to the historian writing the placards. Following this hunch made my dreams come true. And hopefully... <laughs> And so maybe this will inspire you next time you see a placard and you got a question to follow a hunch too. Thank you. Thank you.